Chapter 9, Slides 19 to 34. In the previous set of slides, where we reacted an alkene with an acid, like, I don't know, H2SO4, HCl, what I want you to notice is that we always start with the nucleophile being the pi bond, and we attacked the hydrogen and the leaving group left, right? Ultimately, this gave us a carbocation. We added the hydrogen on uh, the right, in this case, putting the carbocation at the more substituted position. Okay, take a snapshot of this mechanism. Look at the arrows. Now, we ended up with a carbocation, <clears throat> which is a high energy intermediate, and you know what? That The atom that we just put on, the atom that we attacked, couldn't do anything about it. Like, you made this carbocation, and the hydrogen you put on is just staring longingly next door going, sorry, I can't help you. I'm just a hydrogen. I don't have really any electron density to give you. Right? So this is what makes all of those reactions for pi base interesting, because what you did is you made a bond with a hydrogen, which has really no electron power at all, and you've created this other problem. You've created the carbocation. The next class of reactions we're going to look at are called syn3. And what I want you to notice is that the electron pushing is going to look very familiar to the pi base. You're going to attack some atom, okay? And you're going to kick off a leaving group. It won't look like exactly like this every time, but it'll have that similar trend. So really nothing different from our pi base. The, the difference here is that we're not going to be attacking a hydrogen. The new bond is going to be with some atom that has a lone pair. So notice that this is a concerted mechanism. This does not form a carbocation. Why? Because as that bond is being made to the atom that has the lone pair, that lone pair can help quench that positive charge that would have ensued. So we end up with this extra arrow from the lone pair, and we never see the formation of that carbocation. See the blue arrow? That is a bond being immediately formed so that you never see a positive charge. The result of this is a three-membered ring. So we're going to see a three-membered ring with some atom, and depending upon what reagents we use, the atom will be different depending upon the reagents. It'll be different in each case. So this is the common electron pushing trend that you're going to see for a syn3. Now understand that we're still working with the double bond. So the carbon-carbon double bond is, each carbon is sp2 hybridized. We're talking about a very flat landscape, right? Trigonal planar. So this cyclopropanation, since it's concerted, is going to happen from either face of the alkene. You're going to get a three-membered ring from the top or a three-membered ring from the bottom. Equal opportunity. Why? because of the geometry of the very flat trigonal planar uh, alkene. Let's take a look at how we might model this using our hands. Okay, both the back and the forward um, three-membered rings can be formed. So let's just take one of them. I'm just going to grab the one where it formed at the top, and I'm going to use this one. I understand that both of them can be formed, but to have this next discussion, I want to point out the general trend for where we can go from here. As I mentioned, three-membered rings are not super stable, so there may be some advantages to forming these three-membered rings. What you're going to see is a few different scenarios, and I've highlighted with a red uh, box the possible products that you can get from a syn3 mechanistic motif. So starting from the alkene in scenario one, we may do a reaction using syn3, syn3 mechanism, 
And we might end up with a product that is neutral. And it, it stays like that. You, you can choose to, to keep it that way and say, no, that, that was actually what I wanted to make. I'm done, done with the reaction. Let's, let's isolate that, let's purify it and take an NMR, okay? So that's possible, that could be one of your products. Then you could say, well, maybe I wanna do something with it. I'm gonna exploit the fact that the three-membered ring is uh, unstable, right? Which makes it more reactive. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't isolate them and that they can't be your product. They're just higher energy. Maybe you need to keep it in the fridge at a lower temperature to keep it from reacting any further. Maybe keep moisture and things away from it. But in some cases, you know, the product as a three-membered ring is perfectly fine. Or you could decide to add a strong nucleophile. Hmm, strong nucleophile and something that's willing to break open. Sounds to me like it's an SN2. So what we could actually pose here, so if you will, I'm kind of introducing a new leaving group for you. Depends on what the A, what that A atom is, but we could, if, if the A atom is right, we could use a strong nucleophile and do an SN2 on this very high energy three-membered ring. This will give us a new product. Okay, I know I'm being vague right now. We'll see some examples of these, but I want to show you that after you do a SIN3, there's kind of three possible products you can finish at. We have to be very explicit. I'd have to give you a new set of reagents to do the SN2. But so you could stop right at the neutral three-membered ring. You could take that three-membered ring on for another reaction doing an SN2, or you could do a SIN3 with a different set of reagents. Some reagents that you do SIN3 with won't give you a nice and clean neutral three-membered ring, but you'll be a charged three-membered ring. And you can't end there. The charged three-membered ring is an intermediate, just like a carbocation is, inter in, in, is an intermediate. <laughs> and so we have to actually look further at maybe the solvents, uh, what's in solution, kind of like what we did with um, under the acid base scenarios of um, just pi base reactions. Uh, right now I've looked to the solvents and I see a weak nucleophile, which probably also is my solvent, and this is going to react in a very SN1-like manner. Right? We have a charged positive species, a weak nucleophile, and I can apply SN1-like conditions to get to the final neutral product. So there's lots of different scenarios we can consider and I'll be sure to point them out as we go through. Let's start with our first specific case, cyclopropanation. Cyclopropanation can undergo a SIN3 mechanism, mechanistic motif. And how does that work? Let's start with the alkene. Now an aside here on the reagents, C H BR3 in the presence of a base. Now what this is, is an acid-base reaction. When you mix these two reagents together, the base will do acid-base chemistry with the one proton you see giving the electrons to the carbon. You might think, well, carbons are not very Carbon-hydrogen bonds are not very acidic, and they're not, but when you have three bromines on there, all withdrawing groups, ARIO tells me that the atom's not really good. There's no re it, uh, resonance going on, but we do have a strong inductive force. You have three electron withdrawing groups, all helping to pull that extra electron density of the carbon Remember, a carbon minus means that the carbon has a, a lone pair. So it has an octet, and it's stabilized by three very electron withdrawing groups around it. Now, in solution, what happens is that additionally, in this case, to form the carbene, the reactive species, you end up with two bromines, one of the leaving groups leave, it's almost like a solvolysis thing, 
take a look at this crazy looking reactive, highly reactive intermediate. This is called a carbene. The carbon overall, because the lone pair makes it negative, but then the leaving group leaving makes it positive, the carbon is both negative and positive at the same time. What this looks like from an orbital perspective is that the carbon has is got its sp2 orbitals, right, with the bromine and the other bromine. So you've got those, it's sp2 trigonal planar, and then it has that one empty p orbital that makes it positive because it's empty. So one of the sp2 orbitals has the lone pair. The, the p orbital is empty. It is this crazy neutral carbon that is both a nucleophile and an electrophile at the same time. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I think, I think they're wondrous things, but they are very bizarre when you really get down to it. A carbene. So the carbon is both positive and negative at the same time. So remember what I said, right? The carbon is going to be the electrophile because it's positive. So the pi bond is going to attack it. That helps to quench the positive charge. We're not going to form a carbocation at carbon one, right? So let's say the, the carbon and carbon two are forming a new bond. There would be a carbocation at one, but because the atom that I'm using has a lone pair, it back attacks. This concerted reaction gives you in one fell swoop both top and bottom or back. And then you can decide, is this molecule chiral? Are these the same molecule? Do you have a stereo center? No. So you can just draw it as one. But this is a cyclopropanation, making a three-membered ring using a carbene. Now there's lots of different types of reagents that you can use. So when you're making your flashcard, you could make one for each reagent set. The answer on the back should be sin three for each case. I just showed you how it works relative to acid-base chemistry on the previous page to form this dibromocarbene, right? The carbon is both positive and negative at the same time. Another way to do this is to use diazomethane and some heat. If you think about what diazomethane looks like, CH2 to a nitrogen to a nitrogen. The whole thing is neutral, so what must that look like? You could write it like this, but understand that it is in resonance. I can draw the resonance structure. And so this gets us a little closer to what the carbene must look like. There's your negative carbon, right? So the carbon is negative. The nitrogen has a positive charge still in the middle. And then this is what happens is that when you heat it, so when you heat it or expose it to light, give it some energy, what's going to happen is that this bond breaks and the electrons go to the nitrogen. Why? Well, then that the nitrogen can leave as N2 gas, neutral, right? That's your gas. That bubbles away. Bubble, you start seeing bubbles evolve in your solution. You know that's the N2 gas bubbling out of your solvent. What's left behind is the carbon was already negative, and when this N2 leaving group leaves, the carbon is now a carbene.
right? Because it lost that leaving group. The N2 is the leaving group, just like a bromine. So that's another way to make a carbene. And notice what you end up with here. In the first case, the carbene was going to make a three-membered ring, but you're going to have two bromines off of it. In this case, if I used the CH2, I could make a carbene with two H's off of it. So I make just a clean cyclopropane. There's lots of different types of carbenes. Here's a stable carbene off here on the right. It's got a melting point of 240 degrees and it's stabilized through resonance. So it's a lot easier to deal with in the lab. The, the two that I've just mentioned here are fairly unstable, but there are other cases that are easier to work with. Another example is the Simmons-Smith reagent. And this too will get you the CH2, cyclopropane, if you will, see right here. How this works is it is stabilized by the metal coupling to it. And so you can think of it, this is how I like to think of it. You've got your CH2 here, you've got iodine, iodine. And effectively, the zinc copper, the zinc can actually remove one of the, the iodines for you. And that's where you get the zinc iodine over on the right hand side. That, that's what gives the carbon its lone pair. And then the remaining iodide is assisted through the copper to um, leave as your leaving group, you can think about it as being assisted to leave, and that's what gets you to the copper plus and minus at the same time. However, this um, carbon is still bound and stabilized by the zinc, and so you can think of it as a pretty stable carbonoid. Carbonoids are, they're basically all uh, molecules with all the characteristics of a carbene, but they're usually stabilized by a metal. Um, so this is considered a carbonoid species. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Simmons-Smith gives you a carbene that will put a CH2 as your atom, right? So you can still, it's okay if you just think about it like this. Mechanistically, let's do it again together. Start your pen on the nucleophile alkene. Attack the carbon, because it's positive, but back attack with the lone pair so that you never form a carbocation. This bond making on both sides gives you the cyclopropane. Try a few of these yourself. And again, I've changed up the reagents a little bit just to get you familiar with the acid base formation of a carbene. And you can practice writing out all the possible product or products for each of these reactions. Let's look at another SYN3 reaction. This is called epoxidation. Don't worry so much about the names. I want you to recognize the reagents and how it's going to behave relative to your alkene. We're going to see a similar trend though. One atom, since it's SYN3, we're going to add an atom across that pi bond. Let's take a look at how it looks with our hands. What does the mechanism look like? Actually, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. Okay, We're, let's analyze the reagent. Again, we can have different reagents do this epoxidation reaction. What I want you to notice is that we've got a, an oxygen, oxygen bond. Okay, an oxygen-oxygen bond, we saw this before, an oxygen-oxygen bond specifically is called a peroxide bond. They're unstable, 
okay? Yes, it is a single bond, and single bonds tend to be pretty strong. However, when you have two very electronegative atoms fighting over that covalent pair of electrons between them, both pulling in opposite directions on the, that lone pair or on that, the electrons in the bond, you're, you're destabilizing that, the happiness right, of sharing the electrons. Both very greedy atoms are pulling on them. So it just takes a little bit to break. Remember what we said about peroxide, hydrogen peroxide in your medicine cabinet, right? We keep that in a dark bottle because just the photons of light will turn that into a radical system. So peroxide bonds, despite it being a sigma bond, is a weak bond. That is where most of the reactivity is coming from in this reaction. And if you extrapolate um, these peroxy uh, systems using the dipole, start at the top here, the oxygen is negative, the carbon of a carbonyl is partially positive, the yellow oxygen therefore is partially negative, the blue oxygen therefore is partially positive. So if you had to give a sign one of the oxygens more negativity and one more positivity, this is how it would be when it's next to a carbonyl. That's what makes these carbonyl type um, reagents spe uh, specific and special for epoxidation because you're allowing one of the oxygens to be negative and one to be positive. Another way to look at it is that the group, the carbonyl group, is an electron withdrawing group and so that helps pull the electron density away from that blue oxygen, thus making it positive. Any way you look at it, one oxygen is more positive than the other. And since our alkene is always our nucleophile, that's what we want to hone in on. Now I put an R group here because the R group can change. The R group can be lots of different things. Okay, so let me highlight the, the oxygens so you can see them. Okay, so understand we're doing sin three. So those dotted lines are, I'm showing you the trajectory of where the new bonds are gonna form. Okay, new bonds are gonna form. How am I going to do that? Well, notice again that the, the atom that we're attacking is the blue oxygen. So we're gonna make a new bond between carbon and the new oxygen. We're gonna break the weak sigma bond between the oxygen, the fighting oxygens, because that is your leaving group, it's your weak bond. These electrons are going to fold in and help push the pi bond, right, to grab that hydrogen. So you can see that this oxygen and this hydrogen are gonna be bonded together. And you can understand that the molecule itself, I know we draw it like we did above, but it probably doesn't exist like that. It probably internally hydrogen bonds with itself, right? I mean, that's an interaction that you can imagine that the molecule actually prefers to be in this cis-like orientation because it can intramolecularly, intramolecularly hydrogen bond with itself. So we can see that here as it hovers over the pi bond. And lastly, as that hydrogen is being taken, the hydrogen has to let go and it can form the other bond to the carbon oxygen system. Oh my gosh, I know, that's a whirlwind. This is a concerted mechanism. There is no carbocation intermediate. Let's draw the framework of our alkane. And the pi bond is no longer, it is now bonded to the oxygen. The oxygen is no longer bound to the, the yellow oxygen, which is now double bonded to the carbon, which still has the R group off of it, which still has a single bond to the oxygen, which is now bound to the hydrogen. But the blue oxygen, remember, is also now bound to, through the arrow pushing, you can see it, the formation of the arrow right here shows the formation of that side bond, okay? And so we have formed what we call an epoxide. 
the byproduct, let me redraw this, this byproduct that I'm showing hovering up here, let me redraw that for you. Okay, the byproduct is a carboxylic acid. It's not a peroxy system anymore. I don't have an oxygen-oxygen bond anymore. I have a carboxylic acid, a neutral um, acidic molecule that I can actually extract out in a liquid-liquid extraction in the lab. And this is my final epoxide. It's a concerted mechanism. I can have the epoxide form on the top, or I can form the epoxide on the bottom. Now, going back to that slide I showed you earlier here, we just put an atom in a three-membered ring that is neutral two different ways. We formed the carbene, which ultimately led to a three-membered ring. Now, notice that our product right, was neutral. So we're looking at this first scenario one where we're forming three-membered rings, but our products are neutral. You can say the same thing for the epoxide. I just made a three-membered ring and my product epoxide is neutral. I can totally stop here if I wanted to, right? Epoxides are actually prevalent in nature. We see them biologically as part of biomolecules in our bodies and, and living systems. Epoxides play a large role as a functional group. So I'd like to introduce this as a new and viable functional group for you to recognize. And now we know how to make them. They can come from double bonds. Just a little bit about some reagents that you can use to make epoxides. I widely use MCPBA. Um, don't worry about the, na the nomenclature. This is something you get in Orgo too. But the key here is that you see an oxygen, oxygen, bond together right next to each other. There's your peroxy system. And it has that carbonyl right next door. That's needed. You need that carbonyl, okay? Because that's what makes one oxygen, the blue one, partially positive and the yellow one partially negative. You need to set up the dipole. Otherwise, the alkene doesn't know, doesn't really have a, a desire to attack one or the other. Another example is magnesium monoperoxyphthalate. Again, you see the same thing. That's why I wrote the R group, right? It doesn't really matter what the R group is. The R group, as you saw in the mechanism, really doesn't play a role other than to make the peroxy acid um, more stable so that I can like go to the refrigerator, get a bottle of this MMPP or this MCPBA. I can get a bottle of it. It's a white solid. I can weigh it out and it's um, pretty stable and then I can dump it in my, my flask to do my epoxidation. So what I'd like to do is now say that these epoxides are new leaving groups for us. Why? Well, understand that ethers are something that you guys have been using in lab, diethyl ether, Another good ether is THF, tetrahydrofuran. This is THF, and this is diethyl ether. These are very common solvents, very common solvents. They have just enough polarity to get things into solution, right? To get our organic molecules into solution, but they don't have a proton on the oxygen. So they're not protic solvents. Therefore, they're not prone to acid-base chemistry. They're stable. Everyone's happy and they have just enough polarity to be the solvent and get things into solution. Epoxides, though, are actually very reactive and they're never really used as a solvent. Why might you think they're, re they're reactive? Even though they're an ether, it's a carbon, oxygen, carbon. They're reactive, but diethyl ether and THF are not reactive in the same way. Well, the reason for this, if you haven't guessed already, is the ring strain, right? Epoxides have ring strain. It's a three-membered ring. There's torsional strain, angle strain, leading to a lot of ring strain. 
Therefore, their, sig their single bonds are not as strong as typical sigma bonds because they're, they're kind of bent and they're, they're crunched and they're strained. So they're ready to pop. So this allows us to, co to consider them as leaving groups. So I want to put them into our alkyl halide leaving group basket. And we'll come back to this. But I want you to understand that epoxides are stable enough to be isolated. They're stable enough to make and then keep in your refrigerator and run an NMR and a TLC and take the melting point of. But they are reactive and you can do further chemistry with them in a way that diethyl ethers and THF cannot. Here's some practice for you. What alkenes might the following epoxides have come from? And what epoxides can you make when you start with the alkenes shown here? Make sure that you draw the major products, do the mechanism of syn addition, and consider all possible products made for the major products. Okay, so we have an epoxide as a possible product. We could be happy with that. I mean, an epoxide is neutral. Okay, it has some ring strain in it, but I could make that my final product. Or I could do more chemistry on it. I want you to think about an epoxide because of its ring strain as being another functional group that we can do things with. All right, so what can we do with it? Well, if we consider the ring strain as making those sigma bonds on either side strained and more reactive than a normal sigma bond, then we can do SN2 chemistry on it. We're going to treat the oxygen as our leaving group and consider that each carbon it's attached to is a viable electrophile. Now, when you're under SN2 conditions, Right? We're going to be using a strong nucleophile. So I would have to give you a new reagent and say, hey, take this starting material epoxide and here's a strong nucleophile. Then what you're going to do is say, well, epoxides are my new alkyl halide in a sense. And I can apply SN2 conditions. What's important for SN2? Well, those strong nucleophiles are in charge. right? The nucleophile's in charge. So it gets to it gets to decide where it's going to attack. There are two carbons that are partially positive. And I'm showing you the two partially positive carbons. Now, what's charged? Well, the nucleophile's in charge. So that means the epoxide sits as an equilateral type triangle, meaning the epoxide's happy, right? The epoxide's like, I'm neutral, do what you need to do. I have two carbons that I'm attached to, right, because there's an overall dipole moment. And, you know, go ahead, attack either one. I don't care. I'm not in charge. You're in charge. So in an SN2 scenario, if you're given an epoxide that's neutral, then the, nu the nucleophile gets to choose. Think about what governs your SN2 reactions. Steric hindrance, right? You guys always wanted to attack the less sterically hindered alkyl halide, right? Primary was better than secondary, was better than tertiary. The same happens here. If I give you a strong nucleophile and the epoxide is your starting material, you're going to look at each carbon and decide that the regioselectivity is going to be chosen based on steric hindrance. Do an SN2. I like the carbon on the right because it's a secondary, while the one on the left is tertiary. So my nucleophile is going to attack the less sterically hindered carbon, kicking off the leaving group, which is the oxygen. So the oxygen ends up gaining the extra set of electrons. Notice that it is still tethered to the molecule. So the leaving group doesn't leave and go floating off into the solution. It still has another bond, right? So it's still hanging on to the molecule but the O minus has formed on our system. So it gives me this almost finished product here, the O minus. It just needs a little bit of workup. We need to treat it with some acid to satisfy the O minus. And what you'll notice 
just like in SN2, the nucleophile came in from the opposite face of the leaving group. So since the epoxide was in the front, the nucleophile came in from the back. But notice that the tethered bond, right, the other bond stays the same. Nothing happened there. Your arrows did not show anything happening to that arrow. So keep that, sorry, anything happening to that bond. Keep that bond the same. Nothing happened there. All the chemistry happened in an SN2 fashion at the less sterically hindered carbon. Okay. Well, what if I wanted to operate under SN1-like conditions? Starting from this neutral epoxide, I can add an acid. So we're going to go in a different trajectory here. I'm going to do some acid-base chemistry. I'm going to make the oxygen a better leaving group by adding an acid. I don't know, HCl, H2SO4, something. So I add an acid. So the first thing that's going to happen is that my oxygen is going to protonate. Oxygen is the base and it protonates with the acid that you introduce to form a charged epoxide species. Now I can introduce a weak nucleophile, but who's in charge? Not the nucleophile, the epoxide's in charge. The epoxide gets to tell the nucleophile where to go. How does it do that? Well, bond elongation is something that occurs. Notice that, again, we still have two carbons that the nucleophile could attack. But when you're in charge, you get to, tell the, uh, you get to make the decision on where the, the chemistry is going to happen. In the SN2 scenario above, the nucleophile was in charge, and so it chose to go after the less sterically hindered carbon that was sp3 because that's just easier for it. When the electrophile is in charge, in this case the epoxide, remember that ring is very unstable. And so it starts to move in a direction, taking its electron density with it, so that the, the once equilateral triangle that we saw up here is no longer an equilateral triangle. What happens is that if you have one carbon that is more substituted than the other, the oxygen bond elongates away from the carbon that would be a better carbocation. Do you form a carbocation? No, the bond never lets go. It just elongates, it gets really long. So that means the electrons, the electron density, the bond, it's a covalent bond, but it's not a perfectly shared covalent bond. The oxygen is pulling the lone, the, the pair of electrons in the bond more towards it because it's going to be going. It's on its way out. That bond is going to break, releasing the ring strain, just like it did in the scenario one. Releases the ring strain. Oh, three, no more three-membered ring. Feels so much better. But it's going to do it through a different type of mechanism. So when you, when you charge the epoxide, you weaken one of the bonds and it starts to elongate. What this does is it kind of sends a signal to our weak nucleophile. Why? Well, because you've changed the polarity of the system. Now, the carbon over on the left, the one that's more substituted, is losing the electron density as the, as the oxygen moves away and bond elongates. This carbon is way more electropositive now than the other carbon. So you've shifted the electropositivity of the carbons. And you always know which carbon is going to be more partially positive. It's the same rules that apply for figuring out which carbon would rather have a positive charge. I mean, if you're going to lose electron density, the carbon that's more substituted, tertiary, is the one that's going to be more willing to give it up. So it shifts the dipole a bit. It's not an equilateral triangle sort of cyclopro. Uh, propane type system anymore. Therefore, the weak nucleophile, you know, the just partially negative guy, he's just like, just tell me where to go, and the epoxide does so by bond elongating. I always think of it like a relay race. If you're uh, in a relay track meet, 
right? If you're at the line waiting for the person to pass you the baton, you're going to get in that ready stance. And if I, if I had no idea which way the uh, incoming baton passer was coming from, just looking at the person who's getting ready at the line, right? I could tell by their stance. They, they elongate one leg and shorten one leg, and they know exactly which way the baton's going to get tossed, right? They know exactly where they're going to receive it. It's just like that. The epoxide is getting ready, and it's signaling to the nucleophile that you need to attack over here. Why do I say SN1-like? Well, because if the epoxide is from the top, then the nucleophile has to come in from the opposite face. Remember, it doesn't let go of that bond. It simply shifts its dipole. So it's not exactly like an SN1. Why? Well, we didn't form a carbocation. And because we didn't form a carbocation, an sp2 carbocation, we don't get attack from both the front and the back face. The oxygen is still hanging on. It's still hanging on in the case up above here at, in the front. So the nucleophile is going to attack from, in this case, the back. But it's going to attack at the tertiary system due to bond elongation. I model this with my hands like so. Now we have the nucleophile from the back. The methyl just, just moves to accommodate, you know. The methyl is not involved. It just kind of, as it re-aligns um, to allow the nucleophile to come in from the back, it gets pushed forward. And the OH, still tethered, is on the other carbon now, but still in the front. Nothing happened to this wedge. Notice that that is still the same. None of my red electron pushing arrows said anything about that bond. So it's still there, it's still there hanging on. After a workup, we remove any extra protons because we were, after all, working under acidic conditions. And we remove any extra protons floating around to give us our final product. Now I want you to take a look at the regioselectivity of these two possible products. Right, different regioselectivity. The uh, difference between going the SN2 route and doing the SN1-like route from an epoxide gives you constitutional isomers sometimes. So first, you can do a straightforward Epoxidation. You start with your alkene, scenario one. You form a mixture of front and back side attack of the syn3 epoxidation. And then you look in the second step, they're giving you sodium methoxide. Oh, that's a strong, small nucleophile. I am probably going to attack the less sterically hindered side on each of these, giving me two products. And I've come in from the back because the epoxide was in the front. Came in from the front because the epoxide was in the back. Each one of these then gets worked up with some acid to quench the negative charge. So I end up with an alcohol at those positions. What's the relationship between this product mixture? This is your major product mixture. What is your relationship between them? Well, they are definitely chiral. And here you ended up with a racemic mixture these are enantiomers. Okay, 
Or I could have taken the same starting material, done an epoxidation using Sin 3. I get my mixture of top and bottom face attack of the epoxide formation, and then I react it under acidic conditions. Each one of these gets protonated. using acid-base reactions. And then the weak nucleophile is going to see that there's bond elongation and it's told to attack the more positive carbon. Right, bond elongation is going to cause one of the carbons to be more positive than the other. And it's the one that you would form the carbocation at because that one's more stable. If the oxygen were to lean the other way, it's forming a more positive carbon. Not that it forms a full carbocation, it just forms a more positive carbon, but at a less substituted position. So you wanna, you wanna give it a chance. You wanna stabilize it as best you can. So this, the green light is given because of the instability of, that, of those bonds now, the oxygen starts leaning and it leans away from the more substituted position because that carbon can stabilize positivity better. The weak nucleophile gets the memo and attacks at that more substituted position. And then open it up. I'm going to attack from the back. O, H, C, H, 3. There's still a methyl there. That just moves with whatever goes with the flow. I had to come in from the back because the epoxide was in the front. And I get the other. Same thing, I come in from the front. So the methyl is now in the back. And the epoxide opened to the OH. I am now done. I then work these up under basic conditions, because I was under acidic conditions, so I want to neutralize everything. And I end up with, after all is said and done, an ether and an alcohol an ether and an alcohol the relationship between these two are enantiomers so I get a racemic mixture on this as well here's some more practice for you start with making the epoxide and then look at the second step we're asking you to to do two examples for you to try. Okay, with scenario one and scenario two in hand, we can now talk about halogenation. What happens when Br2 or Cl2 is interacted with an alkene? Let's take a look with using our hands. If I start with this alkene and I think about bromination, I'm doing a sin 3. So one atom is going to add across the alkene in a three-membered ring scenario. Okay, you can see. And understand that this bromine does have lone pairs, so it's not a hydrogen. So take a look at our mechanism. We're going to form a bond. We're going to kick out a leaving group, but I'm not going to let that carbocation form because the bromine has a lone pair. It can back attack and end up with both front and backside attack. Now, these are not chiral, so I really only have to draw it one way. However, bromine is not a happy camper. Bromine with two bonds and two lone pairs is a positively charged species. 
Yep, it can happen. These are called Brominium bridges. And they're unstable. They're intermediates. You can't end the reaction here. We're not done yet. Okay? So what we have to consider then is we can't leave it like this. There's probably something floating around. If nothing else, you know what's floating around? Br minus. So if I use an aprotic solvent, what's going, or, you know, no, nothing else really reactive in the system, if I don't give you anything, if I just say Br2, then the only thing floating around is Br minus. And you know what Br minus is going to do? It's going to attack. Now, be careful here, okay? Well, we've just learned a lesson from epoxides. When you have a three-membered ring, and it's in charge, right? The ring is in charge, the electrophile is in charge. You're under SN1-like conditions, right? The electrophile is in charge. It's gonna tell that weak nucleophile where to go. So here's your SN1-like scenario again. It's, we're kind of repeating that pattern. The bromine is gonna bond elongate and start moving away from the carbon that would be a better carbocation if the carbocation formed. So this bond elongation signals the weak nucleophile, hey, buddy, go here. Okay, attack this carbon, not the other one. So the weak nucleophile is like, okay. Opposite face attack because the bromine doesn't technically let go and I am attacking an sp3 carbon, but I've been signaled to attack the more substituted position because it's more positive due to bond elongation. So I end up with, if I only have Br minus, I end up with the bromine attacking. And ultimately, and when you read the book, ultimately it'll say that overall it gives you an anti-addition overall. Don't memorize the fact that it's anti-addition. I want you to learn that this is a SYN3 SN1 scenario. You'll be able to figure it out no matter what they throw at you. Now let's say that the solvent that this was done in was, I don't know, ethanol. Okay, we did SYN3. That's the first part. SYN3. I formed a berminium bridge from either face. And the weak nucleophile is now the solvent because it's SN1-like, and they told me ethanol, let's say. Okay, if I was told ethanol was the solvent, then ethanol will be the nucleophile. And guess what? It gets signaled to attack both of them from the opposite face at the carbon that's more positive, which case is, again, the more substituted one. So we end up with This species, which after workup under basic conditions leads to this final product. Now notice that the anti-addition with another bromine, you, you, you really don't know which one went where, but when you start using solvents that are not the bromine minus attacking, you start seeing specifically what attack what. I could have given you water. Doesn't matter. Just get very nimble. Don't try to memorize each one of these as a different instance. This is all the same mechanism. You did SYN3. It's a charged bromidium bridge. The electrophile is in charge. It bond elongates, signaling to that weak nucleophile, I'm in charge, this is where you're gonna attack. And you know, it attacks the same, same tertiary position in this case. So we end up with, after all is said and done, after workup, we end up with the alcohol and the bromine anti to one another across the, the two carbons. Now, I want you to do each one of these and recognize that I can give you halides, Br2 or Cl2. I could say dichloromethane is your solvent. This is inert. This one doesn't do anything. It's like it's not there. 
But when you have alcohols or water, that's your reactive SN1-like solvent conditions. And so you've got to just pay attention to the solvent given or not given, right? So I'm giving you an example here, A through F, of experiences with different alkenes and different combinations for you to get the hang of this. One mechanism takes you through the whole thing. The book will name each one of these as an individual case. It'll call, oh, when you have water as the solvent, it's called this. And when you have an alcohol as the solvent, it's called that. Who cares? Just do it. SIN3, SN1. It's, you just have to learn to recognize the reagents. Do you remember in the last set of slides, we did um, hydrogen peroxide and light with HBr? And remember this combo I showed you, this combo ultimately just made a BR radical. And you're like, I've made BR radicals before. I've just used BR too. Why, didn't, why did they use that crazy combination? Why didn't they just use um, BR2 and light and instigate that whole, initiate that whole radical process? Why did we use peroxides and HBR? when we were trying to do the anti-Markovnikov addition. Well, now that you guys have seen this reaction, I can't put BR2 safely into the pot with an alkene. Why? Because it forms bromidium bridges and does all this other chemistry, right? So understand that trying to get a BR radical in solution to do chemistry with your alkene, you need to use the peroxy uh, HBR system because putting straight BR2 into the pot is going to do different chemistry. <laughs> do you see it now? Right? BR2 is not, is not inert for alkenes. BR2 reacts. And remember, when you're instigating or initiating a radical reaction, not all of the BR2 turns into BR radicals. So you've got a majority of BR2 lying around. That's going to just do chemistry. It's going to start forming bromidium bridges with your alkene. And if you wanted to do that other reaction, the HBr across a double bond, but in the anti-Markovnikov sense, then you can't do it using Br2. That's why we had to circumvent the use of that. We still wanted to generate a Br radical, but we had to be sneaky about it. We couldn't use Br2 to make our Br radical. So that's why. Now you understand the, the, the rhyme and reason for why we did that. All right, we're going to combine a couple things we know to make an epoxide. So in addition to using those fancy peroxy acid reagents I showed you, the oxygen-oxygen ones, we actually can get to epoxides through a different method using combined chemistry we already know. So notice I didn't put the mechanism in here. I want you to watch and define it yourselves. So let's start with the alkene. And we're going to do, in step 1a, we're going to do a Br2 with water. Okay, let's see here. Br2, we're going to do sin 3, leaving group leaves, and bromine back attacks. That is going to give me my brominium bridge. Okay, oh look, water is the solvent. And I know that the carbon that's more electropositive, this is a regioselectivity issue, but the charge, large and in charge bromidium bridge is telling that weak nucleophile where to go. The oxygen is going to attack, opening that weak, um, very reactive three-membered ring up. And I get this guy. Now, after workup, uh, that extra oxygen is removed, and I end up with this bromoalcohol. Okay, that's what I would get. Normally, you probably just had a bunch of practice with it. That's what I would get. But then it's telling me, once you get to the product, do this next. So this isn't like a sequential thing. You're not adding all of these in one, one fell swoop. First you add until you get this product here. And then in the next step, it's saying, all right, now add NaOH. You guys had some practice and homework with this. NaOH could be a nucleophile or it could be a base. And it loves to be a base over a nucleophile. Why? 
Steric hindrance-wise, it's so much easier to abstract a proton than it is to attack an sp3 carbon. Just a steric hindrance thing. When given the choice, deprotonate, right? Act like a base. So now what we have is an O minus. That O minus is right next door to a primary alkyl halide. Huh. So after this acid base chemistry, so the first step you could say was syn3, followed by an SN1-like reaction, leading to acid base chemistry in 1B, now I am super primed to do an intramolecular SN2. You guys had a very similar homework problem. Look at that. The BR left. And I have a really nice stable epoxide. So this is using all of our chemistry that we have just learned, right, in one fell swoop. But take it one step at a time. You can do this. Step 1A, because it's BR2, we did sin 3, followed by, because it's BR2, it's, you're, you're going to have to do something else because you're going to get that charged berminium bridge, followed by the SN1-like case. And in the next step, the, the NaOH is going to act like a base, acid-base chemistry, and it's going to wrap up with SN2. Talk about one heck of a combo, right? This is a lot of stuff. So that's the mechanism. We just used four mechanistic motifs to get there. But understand that when we did epoxidation, you were using a peroxy acid. You were under acidic conditions. Okay, we just did epoxidation. We just did it under basic conditions. There are so many ways to get to the same place. And if, you're, if the molecule that you're working with is complex and has sensitivities one way or the other, we have so many different ways of tuning it so that we can still make that epoxide, but maybe the molecule is acid sensitive. Well, then we use the base method and vice versa. The same thing goes for hydration, adding water across a double bond. We've seen this already in the pi base uh, reactions, adding H and OH across the double bond, hydration. There are other ways of doing that. We can use SYN3 and not very acidic conditions, very neutral conditions to get there. Let's build off of what we just discussed. I hope that you see right now, SYN3, SN1-like, it's going to look just like the berminium system. This is called oxymercuration. And those OACs are acetates. OAC is O to a carbonyl with a methyl. This is an acetate. Okay, so it has two of them, O. And these are actually good leaving groups. Why? Because when they leave, the, the oxygen is minus. Ario tells me that um, the O is electronegative, so that's pretty decent. And resonance, it has resonance stabilization. So these are actually pretty decent uh, leaving groups. The mercury has these two O minuses off of it. It's as a metal, a plus two oxidation state. So the metal is, I mean, metals are generally positive anyway. Our nucleophile, no doubt, is going to be the double bond. We're going to do sin three. So the pi bond makes a new bond between the carbon and the mercury. One of the leaving groups leaves. So this is like an, right, it's like bond making, bond breaking, but this is the weird part. The mercury does have a lone pair and it can back attack. So you're never forming a carbocation. 
but you're forming this mercury bridge. Forming this mercury bridge, just like the brominium bridge. It still has one acetate off of it. One of them got knocked off, but the other one's still there. And now this, this intermediate is a three-membered ring whose atom is charged. So it's not, we're not done yet. We gotta do something. And then notice you just have to pay attention to the solvent. Okay, well, what if the solvent was water? We just did the sin three. It led to something that was charged. The electrophile is in charge. And so it's gonna tell that weak nucleophile where to go. And it's telling it, attack the very electropositive carbon, the one that has more substitution, please. So the oxygen does that. Do you see that we're doing this over and over and over again? You start getting used to it. Okay. And we're done at this point. However, this is a very bizarre looking system. And to get rid of the mercury, what tends to happen is that it's worked up under sodium borohydride conditions. Sodium borohydride, or H minus, is um, a reactive species, and we're, we're really not sure how this, it, does it undergo SN1, SN2, it's, nobody knows, right? So I'm just going to say that the hydride exchanges with the mercury, and if you feel like it, if you just wanna, if you just wanna do it because, um, you can, I mean, just, just do an SN2. That's not what it is, but it just set, sort of satisfies, right? If you have a hydrogen with a lone pair, that's a hydride. And this is typically how we're going to see it exchange out. I don't think this is how it happens. I don't think it's an SN2. I think it's more of a reductive elimination, perhaps. I'm not sure, but it's not going to do the SN2. But, it, you know, for all intents and purposes right now, Let's just say it's an, SN, an SN2, okay? SN2 question mark? It at least, you know, helps us account for some, some movement. And so this is considered the workup step. It's what cleaves this um, mercury away. The hydride can also act as a base and take off the extra proton. So at the end of the day, the extra proton is removed and so is Right? There were two hydrogens here to begin with. And if you swap in another one, you have three hydrogens here. Understand that this is the same product we would have gotten had we started with something like HCl and water. Prove it to yourself. Do your pi base SN1 and prove to yourself you would have gotten to the same product. It's just that HCl is pretty acidic. Mercury acetate, neutral. So if you have to be very vigilant about what you're reacting it with, you can choose whichever you know, set of reagents uh, is gonna be amenable to the rest of your molecule. You have acidic ways of doing it, you have more neutral ways of doing it. There's pros and cons. I mean, who wants to work with mercury, right? <laughs> I wouldn't, but maybe you have to because you have to avoid the acid. At the end of the day, you've hydrated your molecule. This is called hydration because you've added H and OH across the double bond. Again, it's not to be memorized. It's to be figured out. Understand the red arrow pushing and you'll notice yourself doing the same thing over and over and over again. This gives you the power to calculate your answer, not wrote, spit it out, and memorized answers, because you're gonna go down the wrong path. Here's a bunch of oxymercurations to pay attention to. Give it a try yourself. Here's a bunch of alkenes, and notice that sometimes I have water, sometimes I have methanol. It doesn't matter. You guys have the power to figure out how this reaction works.